kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We are his kingdom. We are his hands and his feet in this world. He died and rose again and ascended to the right hand of the Father. And he said, you go forth and you tell all the world of who I am, of my goodness and my grace. Amen. In Jesus' name, he is good. Let's give him a hand clap this morning. Thank you. Thank you to our little helpers this morning. <laughs> our little uh, worship team in training. <laughs> the interns. Jesus. Jesus. So I have another very encouraging opening. I know last time I <laughs> last time I started with something really encouraging and uplifting. Today, my opening says people can be mean. <laughs> but you know, it's a real world that we live in. And um, relationships are challenging. And dealing with people is challenging. And you know, even in our church family, we have difficult situations that we have to deal with and we have to understand. People can be mean. People can hurt us, whether on purpose or not on purpose. People can disappoint us. People make, cho- people make choices we don't understand as a parent, as a grandparent, as a friend. It's so hard. You know, as a pastor, lost a brother, it's so hard to understand when people make the choices they do. We don't understand. It, isn't that one of the greatest challenges we face in this world is our relationship with others? You know, Nathan says that God dealt with us and himself. We're good with God. The blood of Jesus Christ paid for all of our sin, past, present, and future. We have nothing to fear from God. We have no judgment left against us from God. We are good here. But here is all the complications around us, everybody around us, the relationships we have. That's where it gets complicated. But how often do we forget as Christians that we're not like everyone else in this world? We are a new creation with God living in us. We're a peculiar people. So we don't need to follow the relationship rules of the world. We don't need Cosmopolitan's top ten rules to keep your man happy. We don't need Dr. Spock to tell us how to raise our children. We need the word of God, which is full of instructions for every situation. We need to learn how to lean on that still small voice of the Holy Spirit that speaks to us every day when we ask and seek for his counsel. And as believers, we are called to a new kind of relationship a new level in relationship, a new way to have relationship. In the Message Bible, Ephesians 4 talks about this, and and I'm applying it to relationships, but it goes to, to a lot of things. It says, the old way has to go. Ephesians 4, 17 through 32. I'm going to read this out of the message, so it's probably not going to match, but... Um, the message, Ephesians 4, 17 through 32 says, And so I insist, and God backs me up on this, that there be no going along with the crowd, the empty-headed, mindless crowd. They've refused for so long to deal with God that they've lost touch not only with God, but with reality itself. They can't even think straight anymore. But that's no life for you. You've learned Christ. My assumption is that you have paid careful attention to him, to Jesus, been well instructed in the truth precisely as we have it in Jesus. Since then, we do not have the excuse of ignorance. Everything, and I do mean everything, connected with that old way of life has to go. It's rotten through and through. Get rid of it. And then take on an entirely new way of life, a God-fashioned life, a life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct as God accurately reproduces his character in you. What this adds up to, then, is this. No more lies, no more pretense. Tell your neighbor the truth. In Christ's body, we're all connected to each other, after all. We're all brothers and sisters. When you lie to others, you end up lying to yourself. Go ahead and be angry. You do well to be angry, but don't use your anger as fuel for revenge. And don't stay angry. That's hard, isn't it? Don't stay angry. Don't go to bed angry. I would not have much sleep sometimes. Don't give the devil that kind of foothold in your life. Did you use 
Did you used to make ends meet by stealing? Well, no more. Get an honest job so that you can help others who can't work. Watch the way you talk. Let nothing foul or dirty come out of your mouth. Say only what helps. Each word is a gift. Isn't that a precious thought to think each word is a gift? And don't grieve God. Don't break his heart. His Holy Spirit moving and breathing in you is the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for himself. Don't take such a gift for granted. Make a, ple- make a clean break with all the cutting, backbiting, and profane talk. Be gentle with one another, sensitive. Forgive one another as quickly and as thoroughly as God in Christ forgave you. That's a picture, right? So where do we start? Relationships are complicated. People are complicated. People are difficult. Not everybody, but we all have difficult people in our lives. We start with who we are in Christ. When we get this right in our own hearts, in our own minds, then we can begin to have healthy relationships this way. It takes every bit of God in us to have healthy, nurturing, loving, godly relationships. Even the people that are the best in our life can test us and see what's really going on in our hearts. Only perfect love can be so forgiving, so full of grace and mercy when the world around you says, are you kidding me? Are you crazy? We have to remember what we just read in Ephesians 4.32. Forgive one another as quickly and as thoroughly as God in Christ forgave you. We forget how much we have been forgiven, and we want to hold that offense against the others. If we are not connected with God, relying on his counsel, his strength, his wisdom, and in constant relationship with him, then it is very quickly going to become all about us. And that's where the trouble begins, when we make it about us, because it's all about him. So before we're ready to talk about relationships with other people, we need to take a closer look at our personal relationship with the Lord. We are called to trust the Lord, to believe his word, and trust that he is faithful. Joshua 1, I got a lot of scriptures here, Sheila, so we're going to play some Bible calisthenics. (laughs) You have a piece of paper and a pen? Joshua 1, 9, this is one of my very favorite scriptures, and I've said it a bunch of different times. Joshua 1, 9. Have, I, have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Be strong and courageous. I just had that etched in a little wood thing in my house. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Mm-hmm. What do we have to fear? God is with us everywhere that we go. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For ye have said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. (laughs) When he is our desire, when he is what we seek, when he is what we want, what what we seek with all of our heart, This is talking about money, right? Covetousness, stuff. It's talking about the stuff, right? Tim talked about in his opening. The stuff doesn't make us happy. The stuff doesn't help with relationships. It eases a certain kind of strain, but money does not provide love, right? And when when we understand his promise that he will never leave us, he will never forsake us, what do we have to fear that men can do to us? What is there left to fear? People don't like you. People are angry with you. People judge you. Are we out to please people? Or are we out to please God? That's where we have to be strong and courageous. Be bold and strong and very courageous. Psalm 910. The Psalms are just full of beautiful encouragement to remind us to trust the Lord. That he is trustworthy. Psalms 910. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. I like what Tim said, not yet. There's no yet. There's no yet. He is not going to fail you. He is not going to leave you. He is not going to forsake you. Psalm 13, 5. We can be bold and put our trust in him and know that he is going to be there. Psalm 13, 5. 
But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. Yes. There is such joy when we can just let go of all that worry. Yes. You can't have joy in worry. You can't have joy in doubt. You can't have joy in any kind of anxiety. You can only have joy when you are at peace and know and rejoice in thy salvation. Mm -hmm. Romans 15, 13. Romans 15, 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. And if there's one thing, this spirit of suicide, this, we see so many people that choose to end their life. And it's something that's so confusing to me. But it's a lack of hope. Hope. Hope that we have been given as a gift. God will fill you. The God of hope. He is the God of hope. He is a God of purpose. He is a God of love and joy and peace. And when we will put our trust in the God of hope, he fills us with that joy and that peace. But this world around us steals it. But if we are strong and courageous to just reject all of that and just turn to the God of hope in every situation, every time, and let his peace and his joy fill our hearts, he is faithful to do it every single time. Psalms 33, 4, 33, 4 through 6. Psalms 33, 4 through 6. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment, and the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. But the word of the Lord, by the word of the Lord, were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. The word of the Lord is right and true. We can put our hope and our trust in the word of God. But in order to trust God, we have to let go of worry and of fear. And those are the things that plague us. They plague us with other people's chatter in our ear. It plagues us with our own minds, our worrying, our what ifs, what ifs, what ifs, what ifs. Because troubles are just part of being in this world. Proverbs 12, 25. Proverbs 12, 25. <coughs> Heaviness in the heart of man maketh stoop, but a good word maketh glad. And another translation says, worry weighs a person down. An encouraging word cheers a person up. Matthew 6, 34. We have a choice. Every time that thought comes in our mind, we have a choice. Are we going to listen to it and chew on it and chew on it some more and worry about it and stew on it? Or are we going to just say, no, God, you know. You know the end from the beginning. God, I trust you. I trust you that you will make a way where I can't see it. I don't understand it. I don't know what's going on. But I trust that you're going to make a way. Take therefore. This is Jesus telling us. Can he make it any more plain? Take no thought for tomorrow. For, the t for, for tomorrow shall take thought of, of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And another, another translation says, So don't worry about tomorrow, for to tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Yes. <laughs> How many times when we lose our peace and our joy are we worrying about tomorrow? We, we're not even in tomorrow yet. Exactly. That's, that's just a trick, right? It's in our minds just want to go there. It's just so odd to me that naturally that's just like, I don't know if it's a mom thing or if it's just a human thing. I don't know, men, do you guys worry too? But like, as a mom, you're just constantly playing things out and worrying about things that are never going to come to pass. Exactly. We invent the most horrible situations and we worry it through and we, we, you know, and we work ourselves up. But those things are never going to happen. So, can we agree that today, yes. what we look for is what we find. Yes. What we seek is what we find. Yes. And when we seek the blessings with a thankful heart, when we seek the joy, when we seek the Lord, he, that God of hope, when we seek the God of hope, he fills us with that joy and that peace. Isaiah 41.10. Isaiah 41.10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. He's making it clear. You. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my right hand of righteousness. 
This is him personally speaking to each one of us. I am your God. Do not fear anything, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Be assured, I will help you. I will certainly take hold of you with my righteous right hand. My right hand is a hand of justice, of power, yes. of victory, and of yes. salvation. Yes. Again, when we choose to take his hand, all of that just fades away. We're called to humble ourselves before the Lord. This is hardest for me when things are going good. <laughs> You're just cruising along and you forget that you just still, still when things are good, when things aren't troubled, when things are going well, we still have to take time and remember to humble ourselves before the Lord or pretty soon we're going to find a position where we're humbled. <laughs> First Peter 5, 6, and 7. First Peter 5, 6, and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, unto the mighty hand of God, that right hand we just talked about, that he will exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Our God cares about every detail of our life. Yes. He cares for you. He knows what's best for you. He wants what's best for you. He wants the perfect for you. We don't know what that is sometimes. We don't see the end from the beginning like he does. But he knows Second, Chron Second Chronicles 7.14, this is a very familiar scripture. When we will humble ourselves, there's even a blessing that comes on our land, on our country, on our people. Not just for us, if we'll humble ourselves. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. There's a blessing that comes when we'll pray for our country. We'll pray for our leaders and we'll pray for our governments. Micah 6 and 8. Micah 6 and 8. <coughs> Micah 6 8. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? And um, the Amplified says, he has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you except to be just and to love and to diligently practice kindness and compassion and walk humbly with your God, setting aside any overblown sense of self-importance or self-righteousness. We didn't clean ourselves up. Exactly. We didn't create this better version of ourselves. We didn't stop sinning because we are better people because we're, you know, I you know, have very strong self-control. We are saved by grace. Amen. It is a free gift. And when we forget that, then we lose our way. Colossians 3.12. Colossians 3.12. Colossians 3.12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering. And the Amplified says, So as God's own chosen people who are holy, set apart, and sanctified for his purpose, and well-beloved by God himself, put on a heart of compassion, put on kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, which has the power to endure whatever injustice or unpleasantness comes with good temper. I would like good temper. <laughs> that would be a good thing to have. <laughs> I don't always claim good temper. So we are called to humble ourselves before the Lord. We are called to know God and live every day in intimate relationship with him. Second Peter 1, 5, and 6. It's those quiet moments alone with him. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness. Knowing God leads to self-control. Self-control leads to patient endurance, and patient endurance leads to godliness. Godliness leads to love for other Christians, and finally you will grow to have genuine love for everyone. Genuine love for everyone is what this version defines as godliness. Genuine love for everyone. It is so hard to love some people. 
and they make it so difficult. But godly love loves everyone. James 4, 8. James 4, 8. Lots of scriptures. Thanks, Sheila, for hanging in there with me. <laughs> draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. When we choose to seek him, he always makes himself found. Philippians 3, 8. Philippians 3, 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. But more than that, the Amplified says, I count everything as lost compared to the priceless privilege and supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, and of growing more deeply and thoroughly acquainted with him, a joy unequaled. For his sake, I have lost everything, and I have considered all garbage so that I may gain Christ. He is a precious, precious prize. And when we will set aside our time, when we will turn our eyes and our attention, let go of all those worries, all those doubts, humble ourselves, and just come to him, we get to know him and be like him. Uh, Ephesians 5.1. Ephesians 5.1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. What do dear children do? They imitate their fathers, right? The Amplified, therefore become imitators of God. Copy him and follow his example as well beloved children imitate their father. He has set an example. Jesus has set a perfect example of how to have relationship with the father. He had to go get away. We saw over and over in, the, in the, um, his story where Jesus said, okay, guys, I'll be right back. And the disciples were like, what? A storm came or he cro they crossed an ocean. He was trying to get away because you can't commune with God with all of this going on around us. We have to close ourselves away and we have to seek God for ourselves. And then Jesus was ready to deal with this. Psalms, 41, or excuse, Psalms 42, 1 through 2. Psalms 42, 1 through 2. I love some of these psalms, some of these images. Um, Psalm 42, 1 and 2. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? The Amplified says, As the deer pants longingly for the water brooks, so my soul pants longingly for you, O God. My soul, my life, my inner self, thirsts for God, yes. for the living God. When will I come and see the face of God? Yes. Is that our desire? Yes. When we wake up in the morning, do we long to see the face of God? Yes. I'm just going to read this. This is a long one. Sheila. Psalms 30, 63, 1 through 11. O oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. We've had glimpses, right? Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help, Therefore, in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for foxes. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that sweareth by him shall glory. But the mouths of them that speak lies shall be stopped. Yes. The Psalms are full of beautiful pictures of our hearts longing for him. And we're called to rely on and listen to the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Galatians 22, so, excuse me, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, 
joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Another version says, but when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Here there is no conflict with the law. When the Holy Spirit controls our lives, that is the key. If this life was all about just a relationship with God, things would be wonderful. So simple, but it isn't. We have spouses, we have children, we have parents, we have in-laws, we have family, friends, coworkers, and strangers all around us day in and day out. And it's in our nature to want to be in control, right? It's in our nature to dominate, to want to know. Mm -hmm. Parents, because I said so, right? (laughs) You see, God gave us dominion over all of the earth. We were created to rule and reign over everything in the water and the land and in the air. This gives us a sense of power and control. But that is what we were created to do, to be fruitful and to multiply and have dominion over all of the things of the earth. But we were not given dominion over people. We were not given dominion over people. Yet we struggle in worry, in unbelief, in doubt, trying to control the outcomes in relationships. We argue, we cuss, we fuss, we fight, trying to exert our will, our ideas of right and wrong, our way of thinking on others. It just doesn't work. And if we can't even control ourselves, then what hope do we have to control others? We're fooling ourselves if we think, am I in control of this tiny little udder 24-7? I would say no, because I don't want to lie to you up here. If I can't control myself, How on earth do I think I can control anything else around me? So let's agree to just stop trying. Can we just agree? Let's just stop trying. Church, we have got to figure out how to have godly relationships with one another. To build a healthy church family that flows naturally from a healthy family at home. This is where the rubber meets the road. We have got to mature in our faith and see other people as God sees them. We have got to see the root of the matter, right? We see the actions. We see the outer things. That's not really what's going on, is it? It never is. We see the reactions. We see the outward stuff. That's never really what's going on. And Joyce Meyer said it. She said, hurting people hurt people. And hurting people need love and grace and peace and hope and joy the most. And guess who was sent to give it to them? That's our job. That's our job as Christians, is to love the unlovable, to be kind to those who are not kind, to give grace where it is unmerited. It is so easy to give grace when people are nice and kind, but boy, is it difficult, and it challenges who we are in Christ, right? Are we just showing an expression of Christ? It's no longer I who live, but Christ who liveth in me? Or is it I who live and speak, (laughs) right? That's the test. So here's some scriptures, and and guys, I've been praying about this a lot. We have some situations going on here at the church even that are real and are difficult and are complicated and are testing us. And this is an opportunity for us as a church to figure it out. And so I've been praying about this a lot, and this is why I want to talk about this today. And Michael's like, you're talking about relationships. Is this a marriage thing? I'm like, no, it's not about you. (laughs) It's not about you. I promise. not about you. But relationships test us. More than anything else. All of the, the health and all that kind of stuff. That is, I mean, those things come and go. The money. I mean, like all the other stuff. But really, the one thing God talked about and Jesus commanded us more than anything is love one another. Exactly. And that is the hardest thing to do. And we want to make it about all these other things. And it's just about are we willing to put aside ourselves and love one another? Amen. Are we willing to do that? Okay, here we go. So, I wrote down, don't live in anger. There are times, you guys, when my temper, I don't know where it comes from. And, you know, and I used to notice that on Sundays, I get crabby. I don't know where it comes from, but there is a temper, right? And and, and the Bible just told us, it's okay to be angry, but don't stay angry. You can feel anger. There's times when anger is appropriate. But don't stay angry. And don't provoke others to anger. And it is hard. (laughs) 
You know, it is hard because we are so reactionary, especially if someone has wounded us and we're trying to work through forgiveness. It, that is when it's most difficult because the minute that, you know, that wound isn't quite healed and the salt goes and they press it and it hurts and you're, ah, wounded animals lash out, right? Yes. We are called to be slow to anger. Yes. James 1.19. James 1.19. James 1.19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. The Amplified says, understand this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Let everyone be quick to hear, be careful, thoughtful listeners, slow to speak, a speaker, speaker of carefully chosen words, and slow to anger, patient, Reflective and forgiving. <laughs> Ephesians 4.26. <coughs> Ephesians 4.26. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. We've all heard that one, right? Don't go to bed angry. Yeah. Be angry. Be angry at sin, be angry at immorality, be angry at injustice, be, be angry at ungodly behavior, but do not sin. That is a, another way of saying be angry at the sin, not the sinner, yeah. right? People don't know. People that don't know God, that don't have God, that don't have the Holy Spirit in them, that don't have that love and acceptance that we have all received, they don't know. But do not let your anger cause you shame, nor allow it to last until the sun goes down. If we just hunker down in that righteous anger, you know, I, I hear people say, well, Jesus got angry. He got angry at religion, at religious behavior. He never got angry at people, exactly. ever. I, don't, I, don't, I can't find one instance in the Bible where he got angry at a person. Proverbs, which is full of wisdom, Proverbs 14, 29. <coughs> Proverbs 14, 29. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, very wise. But he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. He who is slow to anger has great understanding and profits from his self-control. But he who is quick-tempered exposes and exalts his foolishness for all to see. I've, I've, uh, I've uh, thrown my foolishness out there for all to see, and it's not fun, and you have to ask forgiveness. But can we learn, and can we just choose not to stay there? We all have our moments. Ecclesiastes 7, 8, and 9. Ecclesiastes 7, 8, and 9. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not hasty in, the spirit, in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. The end of a matter is better than its beginning. Patience of spirit is better than haughtiness of spirit or pride. Do not be eager in your heart to be angry, for anger dwells in the hearts of a fool. So we're called to drop it, right? To let go of our anger and to not, to not incite anger in others. Proverbs 15.1 says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. Proverbs 7.14, The beginning of strife is like getting out of See how that I speak. The beginning of strife is like letting out water as from a small break in a dam. First it trickles and then it gushes. Therefore, abandon the quarrel before it breaks out and tempers explode. Yeah. You know in the beginning when the tension's starting and it's just pick, pick, drip, drip, and all of a sudden the floodgates open and every possible thing that's ever happened in every situation of a person's life ever is like blah. <laughs> And then it becomes stupid, right? I mean, very quickly, it just becomes stupid. It becomes irrational. It's not even about what started it. It just becomes ridiculous. And that dam breaks. And what's funny is um, this proverb, um, there was a note in my study Bible that said the ancient rabbis derived from this statement the principle of seeking a settlement before a case comes to court. So there's actually the thought that if someone has something against you, settle it before you even have to go before the judge. Right. Settle it. Settle it. Figure it out. 
figure it out. You really have to take it to court. I mean, like, how, we are just in a lawsuit happy world right now. Everybody wants to go to court. Everybody's looking to sue somebody. I was, you know, and then, I'm, I'm not, I'm not you know, saying there's anything wrong with personal rights, but can we just work it out? Can we just find a way to settle things? Um, Matthew, I'm going to read this out of the Amplified. This is Matthew 5, 21 through 26, talking about personal relationships. And this is Jesus giving us an example of relationships. You have heard that it was said to the men of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be guilty before the court. But I say to you that everyone who continues to be angry with his brother or harbors malice against him shall be guilty before the court. And whoever speaks contemptuously and insultingly to his brother, you empty-headed fool, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says you fool shall be in danger, in danger of fiery hell. So if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and while there you remember that your brother has something, such as a grievance or a legitimate complaint against you, leave your offering there at the altar and go. First make peace with your brother, and then come and present your offering. Yes. Come to terms quickly at the earliest opportunity with your opponent at law while you are with them on the way to court. Even if you're walking to the courthouse together, figure it out so that your opponent does not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you're thrown into prison. Yeah. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid the last cent. Mm -hmm. It is better to just figure it out together. You know, when we get angry, we start judging and we start pointing the finger and it's all about us. <laughs> Anger is always all about us. It's about our hurt. It's about whatever circumstances. And I'm not saying that there's not a reason for it, but anger is always all about us. And that should be our first red flag. And here's the problem. Anger turns into unforgiveness and unforgiveness turns into bitterness. So one problem leads to another that leads to another. And Hebrews 12, 15, so encouraging. <laughs> I promise there's good news on the other side. <laughs> Hang with me. Hebrews 12, 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. The ESV says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it, many become defiled. Bitterness causes big problems. Unforgiveness always leads to bitterness. And that is where families break, churches break, relationships are just done in. Because when there's bitterness, there can be no healing. That is a root that has to be plucked out by the Lord himself. And if we come to him and we ask him, he will do it. He will heal those hurts and he will, he will help us. But isn't it better to not have to go there? Because those hurts run so deep by the time we're there. Let's just not go there. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Um, Ephesians 4, 31 and, 4, and 31 and 32. 4, 31 and 32. Must be, must be getting close to using all my words. Like, <laughs> Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You know, so many people, I, I try to encourage people, I, you know, there's just awful things going on with people at work, marriages falling apart, years of deceit coming out, and it's just hard to encourage people when they're going through these really tough situations. Nathan, you know, Nathan found out, his, I mean, things happen. You know, we have no control and we find ourselves in these situations and it's so hard to want to be kind to someone who has hurt you. It is so hard to be forgiving when something seems unforgivable. But it's what we are called to do. It's who we are called to be. And if we are dealing with believers in Christ, people that know the Lord, we are called to see Christ and Christ in them. We are called to treat them like Jesus Christ. Amen. And it is hard sometimes. It is so hard. And people say, well, Suzanne, we're not supposed to be doormats for people. No, I agree. You're not supposed to be, there's healthy boundaries. Put healthy boundaries up for goodness sakes. But that doesn't mean that you can't find some way to form a healthy relationship, a godly, healthy relationship. And what that looks like in every situation can be different. There needs to be boundaries 
for healthy boundaries, but there has to be a way to find, to, to, I don't know, I don't know what it is, but we have to find a way to see Christ in others who maybe we, all we can see is a mistake they've made. Um, we are called to be whole and to be healed of our past hurts so we won't be hurting others. Hurting people hurt people. And when we are hurting, we're going to hurt people. And we forget sometimes when, you know, especially if there's something that we're sensitive to, especially in relationships, that's when it comes out what's hurting us. And that hurt needs to be healed, and God, God does that. And Matthew 7, 3, and why worry about a speck in the eye of a brother when you have a board in your own eye? When we are hurting, when we are dealing with something that isn't completely healed, maybe we just need to go all by ourselves and just say, you know what, I need some time, guys. Time out. I'm not in a good place right now. And that's okay. Those are healthy boundaries. Those are times we need, just need to be aware. We are called to be at peace with one another. Don't quarrel <coughs> with anyone, but be at peace with everyone just as much as possible. We are called to give wise counsel, right? And, you know, as believers, I feel like, especially, you know, at work and places where people are familiar with us and we have sort of a you know, I don't want to say a superficial relationship, but we're not, like, we're not family. Um, I guess in my family, I'm kind of the, sometimes a token Christian. People come to me. I do funerals, and I give advice when things happen and things are bad at work. You know, people come to me, want to share things. But we're to give wise counsel. And it's so hard when people come, and they want to tell you all the stuff. And they get sucked into all the drama. Ooh, drama, drama, drama. Soap operas. Can't even make this stuff up sometimes. And it's so hard to not get caught up in the drama and, turn, and gossip and so-and-so said this and so-and-so said that and what really happened. And you know what? It doesn't matter. They need wise counsel. Mm -hmm. They need wise counsel. They need someone who is not going to play the blame game but to help them navigate a very difficult and painful situation. Um, Proverbs 12, 18 says, Some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. Yes. It's our job to help bring healing to people in difficult situations. Proverbs 20, 19 says a gossip tells secrets, so don't hang around with someone who talks too much. <laughs> Proverbs 18, 13, what a shame, what folly to give advice before listening to the facts. Oh, there's some situations where we have opinions immediately. Nobody ever can know everything that happened. The two people in the situation usually don't even know everything that happened because everybody has their own perspective, their own experience, their own situation going on. And sometimes we just can't. You know, sometimes we just don't know, and all we can do is just love them and encourage them and, you know, just, like I said, help them find the path forward. Proverbs 27, 9 says, The heartfelt counsel of a friend is as a sweet perfume and incense. Proverbs 25, 11 says, Timely advice is as lovely as a golden apple in a silver basket, which I thought was a really pretty picture. I'm not that wise, and when it's my, but it's my job to give wise counsel, wise counsel. But that's because I am tapped into wisdom itself. Wisdom itself lives in my heart. Wisdom itself lives in me. I don't have that wisdom, but I have access to all of the wisdom that is and ever will be. And that's what makes us different. We're called to encourage each other. We're called to lean on one another and to reach out and encourage each other when we don't have the strength or the will to make those right choices. 1 Thessalonians 5.11. 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. Encourage one, one another and build each other up, just as you're already doing. Ecclesiastes 4.12. Ecclesiastes 4.12. And if one prevails against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. This is something where, you know, we try to, we try to fight these fights alone. We are not called to do this life alone. We are not called to do it. We need, pe we need people. As much as we want to sometimes just be like, nope, just me and God, we're good. I don't need the drama. I want to stay away from all of it. We are called to be in relationship. We are created for relationship. 
with God and with people around us. So when we, we should not ever be off alone trying to deal with these difficult situations. That's what the body of Christ is for, that's what family is for, and that's what friends are for. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken and God is always that third cord. He is there for us in everything. And when other people don't know God, but they know us, then we bring him in for it. Yes. Ephesians 4, 29. And we read this one earlier. Uh, Ephesians 4, 29. The words of our mouth are so important. The words that we speak are so important. Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. This isn't talking about cursing or foul language. This is talking about are your words healing? Are your words bringing peace? Are your words lifting somebody up or are your words tearing somebody down? We are called to be wise on who we spend our time with, right? There are people that maybe need boundaries and maybe we need to be careful. Proverbs 25, 19. Proverbs 25, 19. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. Putting confidence in an unreliable person is like chewing with a toothache or walking with a broken foot. It's not wise. You know, and sometimes if, how do I say this? Um, you know, we all know those situations where you just can't, we just can't. You have to just say, not right now. Draw the line and just say, not right now. And still pray for them, you know. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Bad company corrupts good character. Proverbs 13, 20. Someone once told me, and this is the way, because I used to think, you know, it's so easy to get caught up in other people's stuff. And someone was telling me, Suzanne, if you're standing on a chair and you're reaching down to pull them up, are you going to get them on the chair or are they going to pull you down to where they are? I thought that was really wise. Because we want to bring people up, but they have to want to step up. You can't drag them up where you are. Proverbs 13, 20. A wise son maketh a, a glad father, but a foolish man despiseth his mother. mother. Whoever walketh with the wise will become wise. Whoever walketh with fools will suffer harm. I don't know if I wrote that down wrong. Kindness and forgiveness, right? We're called to be kind and we're called to forgive. Uh, Proverbs 25, 15. Proverbs 25, 15. By long forbearing is a prince persuaded and a soft tongue breaketh the bone. <coughs> Patience can persuade a prince and soft speech can crush a strong opposition. Ephesians 4.32. Ephesians 4.32. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Proverbs 27.6. And I'll read this out of the Amplified. Faithful are the wounds of a friend who corrects out of love and concern. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful because they serve a hidden agenda. Don't mistake kindness for being nice. Sometimes the truth hurts, but the truth is what sets people free. So sometimes we feel like we can't, or if we're, we have to be nice. Nice is not kind. Nice is don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, don't want to make someone upset. Sometimes kindness is setting people free with the truth. And we are called to forgive one another. Um, and I thought it was interesting that Peter straight up asked Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? How many times? Seven? Seven times ten? Jesus is 70 times seven. You, you have to keep forgiving and forgiving. And I thought, isn't it just like Peter? All right, Lord, how many times? Give me a number. How many times do I have? I'm at five. Do I have, how many more do I have to go? But that's, talking, that's telling us more about Peter, right, and where he was than Jesus. Matthew 6.12 in the Amplified. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, letting go of both the wrong and the resentment. That's in the Lord's Prayer. 
to forgive those. Is that clear enough for us, right? Peter asking, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive? This one is hard. We can say we forgive, but then the hurt comes back around. And then somebody does something again. And then the thoughts creep back in, or the offender does it again, 70 times 7, every single time. Jesus was still trying to teach us about forgiveness as he was dying on the cross. Yes. Luke 23, 34. I'm almost done. Luke 23, 34. Jesus is hanging on the cross between two thieves. And then, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they part his raiment and they cast lots. Jesus is forgiving them as he's being murdered for, for nothing. As an innocent man, he's being murdered. He says, Father, forgive them. Why is it so hard for us to forgive? You know? So can we just agree that it isn't about us? It's all about him. Yes. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So live freely and in him, and he'll give us that abundant life. Amen. And, um, you know, we know that God is love, right? And we are called to be like him. So I'm just going to read a very familiar scripture from 1 Corinthians 13, the way of love. Though I speak with the tongues of man and of angels and have not love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself and is not puffed up. Love does not behave itself unseemly. It seeketh not her own. It's not easily provoked, and it thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in, in, in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Love never fails. But when there be prophecy, they shall fail. When there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But that when, which is perfect is come, and that which is in part shall be done away with. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, and I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. So let us love one another in Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. Um, so I'll just um, pray a blessing over the food, and then we will go downstairs and chow down and have some fellowship. Heavenly Father, we just ask your blessing over the time today, the fellowship today, the gathering of everybody here today. We ask you to bless the hands that prepared the food and bless the food as it nourishes our body, gives us strength to love one another. Be with us all. Be with our pastor today as he is dearly missed. And bless everyone who's here today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.